So today we're going to continue in the Anabaptists. I believe we'll have probably two more weeks of the section on the Anabaptists and then we'll move on from there to another section. Um, but uh, for now we're still with the Anabaptists and continuing with the English Baptists during the Reformation. Eng uh, the English ba Baptists during the Reformation. And um, I was... Uh, so now my, my uh, the clicker thing is not working. Yes, we are. All right. Uh, English Baptists during the Reformation. Uh, the English Baptists were not new in the 16th century, but being called Baptist was new. Uh, and that's, that's an important distinction to make, is that just because they weren't always called Baptist or Anabaptist uh, does not mean that the, those people were not around. It does not mean there were people who were separate from the established churches. It just means they were called by different titles, different names, uh, various groups. It was, in this time, it was harder to organize churches because of persecution. Uh, and so there might have been times when the groups were more loosely organized than traditional churches today. Our, our viewpoint of traditional churches is, well, you have a church building, uh, you, you know, everybody, just, you're just wide open in front of everybody, uh, no, no thought about it. Uh, but there were times when they had to meet wherever, whenever they could, and so there was maybe a looser organization of them, but they were still, um, but they were still in existence at that time. And uh, it is harder to find information about them because many of their writings were destroyed, uh, and that's, that's one of the big challenges regarding church history, Baptist history. It's usually from a very Catholic perspective or a Protestant uh, perspective as far as the established Protestant churches in the respective countries. But uh, as far as when you have groups that are just very loosely organized, there's not going to be a lot of writings about them. And so uh, there's, there's just not as much available uh, regarding the history. Um, and and a, then the other thing is when, when, they're, when you're being persecuted, uh, part of the persecution is the writings being destroyed, um, tracked down, being banned, and that is, that's a, one big reason why uh, it's harder to find information about them as well. Uh, King Henry VIII began his reign in 1509 and denounced Anabaptists three times through official proclamations. By 1525, Baptists were visible in London. Uh, nobody knows necessarily how long they were there at that time, but uh, but persecution made them more visible. Uh, persecu it, 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 it created awareness that, that they were there uh, because of then the persecution. Whereas, you know, if there's no persecution and you have a relative, I mean, very pretty small minority of, of people in a city, uh, they're going to go about and do their business. They're going to worship. They're going to go about their lives. And you might not even know they're there as much. But when the persecution comes, then there is a great visibility uh, that uh, there's an awareness that they're actually there. Two of the preachers in London were Simon Fish and James Bainham. Uh, Fish wrote pamphlets in defense of the Baptist faith. He died of the plague in 1531 and his widow married James Bainham. Bainham wrote the pamphlet, The Beggar's Petition Against Papacy. He and his wife were put into prison in March 1532 on suspicion of heresy. James was brutally tortured on the rack uh, and under duress, he recanted. The next Sunday, still pale from his torture, he stood up in an Anglican church service and in tears confessed his sin of recanting the truth and declared that he would never do it again. He was arrested and placed in chains in, his, in the uh, coal cellar of the Bishop of London. He was repeatedly whipped, but nothing could make him recant his faith again. He was burned at Smithfield on t uh, April 20th, of 1532. So here's one of those examples of recanting and then saying, no, actually, uh, I, that was a great sin that I recanted my faith. Uh, in 1528, seven Baptists from Holland were arrested. Two of them refused to recant and were burned in Smithfield. In November of 1531, Ammonius complained to Erasmus that the Anabaptists continued to grow despite being burned. Uh, in 1533, Henry issued an order which stated that many strangers 
who had entered England were re and were rebaptized had to leave, uh, and they had 12 days to leave. And in 1535, 28 Hollanders were arrested and 14 were burned to death. Uh, in October of 1538, the king appointed Archbishop Thomas Cranmer as head of a commission to prosecute Baptists wherever they were found. And then after Henry King Edward stopped the persecution of Protestants, uh, but allowed the persecution of Baptists to continue. And um, uh, so we see, and we'll see this back and forth where there was different types of persecution going on, depending who was in power, uh, as far as what they allowed. Now, King Henry VIII, uh, remember King Henry VIII was still a, uh, as we talked about him earlier, he was still more of a Catholic at heart. He started the Church of England just because of his, um, uh, some of his different viewpoints regarding uh, marriage and divorce and uh, wanting to uh, annul his marriage or divorce his wife. And he's known for his many wives. But he was still a Catholic at heart where uh, King Edward uh, stopped the persecution of Protestants but then still allowed the persecution of Baptists to continue. Bishop John Hooper wrote in 1549 to complain about the, quote, Anabaptist flock in London that give, uh, the, he says, they give me much trouble. And uh, so another indication, is, these are just little antidotes. And that's a lot of what we see in history is that it's not just who were the Baptists writing the history, it's who were the Protestants or who were the Catholics writing the history um, regarding that, that it, indicate there were other groups there that they called the Anabaptists or the Baptists. And that's also another crucial uh, uh, insight, or at least a crucial tool and some information that can give us more uh, uh, help in, in seeing the history. Uh, Baptist churches existed in the district of Kent. Uh, someone by the name of Cramp wrote, uh, a writer or historian by the name of Cramp wrote, their Christian organization appears to have been correct and complete. They met regularly for worship and instruction. The ordinances of the gospel were attended to. Contributions were made for the support of the cause, and so great was their zeal that those who lived in Kent were known to go occasionally into Essex to meet the brethren there, a journey of fourscore miles, which in the 16th century was no small undertaking. Their separation from the Anglican Church uh, was no later than 1548. Some of the Baptist preachers there were coal of um, actually, I think that's end quote. Um, after when they journeyed into Essex, a uh, journey of four score miles, which in the 16th century was no small undertaking. I believe that is end quote right there. Um, and then continue with uh, more of our information here. Their, uh, their separation from the Anglican Church was no later than 1548. Some of the Baptist preachers there were Cole of Feversham, Henry Hart, John Kemp, George Brodebridge, and Humphrey Middleton. These men had also preached in the days of Henry, and the pastors were arrested during the days of Edward along with 60 members of the congregation. And uh, regardless whether it's dozens or whether it's hundreds or whether it's thousands of people being put to death, being imprisoned, being persecuted, think about the, just the fact that it did exist in England or, or in the other countries we've talked about. Just think about the fact that it did exist that people were being put into prison uh, for their faith and being put, uh, being put to death for their faith. Now, during Edward's reign, John Calvin wrote a letter to Lord Protector Somerset and urged him to put Anabaptists to death. And Calvin is quoted as saying, these all together deserve to be well punished by the sword, seeing that they do conspire against God who had set him in his royal seat. And so, here we see the, the connection between the, uh, the, the king uh, and uh, the, the throne, the crown, and the church. And, uh, you know, that if somehow if you're, if you're going against the, the crown, or if you're, going against, if, you're, if you're believing something outside of the established church, then evidently you're going against uh, the crown. You know, they're conspiring against God, uh, is, is what he said. Uh, Queen Mary reestablished Catholicism in England, which resulted in persecution of both Baptists and Protestants. Humphrey Middleton was imprisoned uh, for years 
during uh, Edward's reign and burned at the stake by Queen Mary in June of 1555. And Queen Elizabeth I established the Church of England on a more Protestant footing. Um, Elizabeth gave freedom to Protestants and treated Catholics with leniency, uh, but she treated the Baptists badly. And I'm looking at just how bad my typing and grammar was on a couple of these slides. But, uh, but she, she gave freedom to Protestants, uh, and, and, and that was a relief for them. Catholics were treated with leniency, so oftentimes the uh, some, sometimes Protestants persecuted Catholics, but there are other times, yes, the Protestant, uh, the Church of England was the established church, but Catholics were also not treated badly. Um, but she treated the Baptists badly. Now, this is one of the things that's unfortunate in our history books, even a lot of Christian history books. Um, Eliana, do you have a question? What does leniency mean? It means that even though she didn't necessarily support the Catholics, she did not come down hard on them, did not persecute them or imprison them or punish them for being Catholic. Um, but it's one of the unfortunate things, even a lot of Christian textbooks, they're usually coming from a Protestant perspective where they don't really mention much about the Baptists and what was going on. And so we'll see all these wonderful things about the Protestants, about Queen Elizabeth, and I'm sure you know, there are certainly good things that can be said, but it leaves out a very important part of history in just simply viewing through the lens of, oh, these were just wonderful people, but knowing, knowing that they continued the persecution, uh, even, even the Protestants. Uh, by a lot of modern day, man, that, that, that's probably the, um, the, uh, Maybe that's, that's some of those who write the textbooks maybe don't see that distinction. But obviously, if the Protestants, if the established Church of England was uh, persecuting the Baptists, they were obviously not part of the same group. Um, and so was, there was definitely a distinction there. Um, but and so a lot of that history is left out of the textbooks. Now, some of the, uh, I know that uh, in one of the history textbooks I used in, uh, in college, and, and there's also used in, in high school. Uh, they, they will talk about Baptists a little bit, and particularly in America, uh, and they'll talk about maybe even Charles Spurgeon, or they'll talk about, um, they'll talk about Roger Williams and some, some of the key figures, but there's a lot left out in regard to what was going on in Europe that it's oftentimes the main part of the main focus of history, which from a bigger picture was Protestant versus Catholic. Um, but that's the bigger picture, but uh, so someone like Queen Elizabeth, we say, well, Queen Elizabeth was, was uh, certainly probably had her qua good qualities, um, but recognizing uh, the, the way that Baptists were treated is very important. Baptists began to emigrate from Holland, France, and elsewhere, hoping for more liberty in England than in their home countries. And so they're thinking, all right, uh, Queen Mary's gone, here's Queen Elizabeth, uh, and the... Um, and so, wow, maybe there's, maybe there's a chance for us because, you know, there's freedom to Protestants, Catholics are being treated with leniency, we're hearing that there's a change going on in England, and so they're hoping for more of that liberty. Elizabeth issued a proclamation that Anabaptists should be located and transported out of England. Uh, so that was not to be the case as far as um, uh, finding religious liberty and a lack of persecution there. And part of this was that she was encouraged by the bishops of the Church of England. Any who didn't leave would be punished. And she said that the Anabaptists were infected with dangerous opinions. And uh, the High Commission Court was established by Parliament on February 4th of 1559. And this, this, uh, in this court, the queen, as part of this uh, court being established, uh, the queen issued an injunction against the preaching of any doctrine contrary to the Church of England. And she also forbade the printing of any what they called heretical books. So anything contrary to the Church of England was considered uh, to be heresy. And so that the for forbidding of printing. And once again, 
That's why we don't see as much of the Baptist history or maybe some of the writers of that day that might have, if they had, uh, those who have had a chance to write anything, um, they just, they were not allowed to be printed. And so uh, certainly limits the availability of uh, those writings in that history. But thankfully we do have at least enough when you put everything together, there is enough to put that picture together of uh, who was around at that time and what was going on. And uh, by the end of 1559, the Act for the Uniformity of Religion was put into effect. Uh, the Act for the Uniformity of Religion. And what it did was made the doctrine and practice of the Church of England the law of the land. Uh, and, I, and once again, we're, we just see, and it just permeates through this, uh, through this history here, whether it's England or whether it's the other countries, uh, it just permeates through the, the great evil of the government establishment of a religion, uh, just how consequential that is. And whether it, it doesn't matter if it's Catholic, it doesn't matter if it's Protestant. Uh, and by the way, that was tried here in, in America and in the colonial days, that was tried in different colonies and the establishment of a religion and it, it, uh, so they continued, uh, it depended who settled that colony and who had control of that colony, whether it was the Puritans, whether it was the Catholics, whether it was the Anglicans. Uh, and then it finally took the Baptists to settle Rhode Island uh, to show something different. Uh, and the other, the other one was uh, William Penn, the Quaker. Uh, he was also pretty tolerant of other religions. And so when uh, Pennsylvania was, uh, was settled, uh, that was also a place where there was not as much uh, uh, persecution. But the real, as far as enshrining religious liberty uh, early on, was the colony of, uh, of what we know as Rhode Island. And they settled, uh, they settled Providence, and uh, they called it Providence, and uh, uh, in the city there. And unfortunately, it's uh, a far cry from its beginnings as far as, uh, religiously speaking, Rhode Island is, or Providence is. Uh, a very, very secular place. and um, In Frankfurt, Germany, there was a lot of uh, Baptists that were there. And uh, the, the German people considered, well, they, they had two state-recognized or recognized mm -hmm. Germans, the Catholics and the Protestants. So the Baptists were considered the lesser educated, louder, more unruly, Protestants, and uh, they felt that a person should be very somber when they went into church. You don't talk, you don't you take care of business. And But the thing is, there was a big, a, a large group of them left, and sometimes I was reading about a whole church in Frankfurt that organized, got together, and it took two or three years. They pulled their resources, did all this, and they left, and they went to America to Texas. Hmm. And they settled in northeastern uh, Texas, and I think even today most of those Germans are are Baptists. I don't know if they're fundamental Baptists. Right, right. Baptists. Yeah, there's a lot of different Baptists, <laughs> especially down south. There's a lot of different Baptists, but even up north, there's a lot of they different Baptists. In but Germany, that we were the more uh, uneducated <laughs> and loud and unruly. Those are the type. Right. <laughs> well, so they went to Texas. You know, and that's and 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 this is this. There may be a time for this a little later that we'll. Uh, um, get into this, but I, I'm not sure how far we're going to get into this as far as the United States is concerned. As far as the book I'm using by David Cloud, it doesn't really talk much about the United States, but I do have another book that um, we might, I might go into, not, not for a very lengthy time, uh, but just to, just to kind of bring us right up to date, as, as up to date as possible. Uh, and the... Uh, but that, that's, that's a good point of the migration of Baptists and why the North is, not, is in the situation it is here in the U.S. compared to the South, is that the South, there are many more Baptists that live in the South. Of course, there's a wide variety of Baptists. But, uh, and it was because those early Baptists, there were a lot of Baptists that settled Rhode Island. There were Baptists who were in Connecticut. And then eventually they, and, and some in Massachusetts, and then eventually there were some key figures that they moved down south to North Carolina, and that's how the whole thing got started down south. And, uh, and, and you know, culturally, they, you know, maybe 
kind of goes along with what the back. <laughs> I thought it was pretty interesting, and I was reading, I read, it, it took me a long time because I'm reading in German, yeah. but uh, the whole thing of the, of the organization, of, and Germans are like that anyway, but they pull together, very organized, and it took them about three, they weren't in a hurry. Mm. They got everything organized, they sold their homes, moved into apartments, it talks about how they, they did all this and planned it out, and then uh, left with their with their resources would just close and like that but everything else was turned was liquidated hmm. and then they they went uh to texas and the reason why they got such firm footing in texas and they did well with the reports coming back was because they're very industrious also very disciplined people there was very little tools they were able to accomplish a lot because they worked together and, and yeah. they got well established in that part of texas and uh, I, I wondered what kind of Baptists they were. Like, yeah, yeah, it's. But you, you uh, couldn't get that. It just said and, that. and this was at what time frame? Uh, oh, this was. Uh, I, I think this was um, around the 1600s, 1700s, okay. or uh, late 1600s, early 1700s, because they closed the castle in Frankfurt. Uh, that was a, it was a, a Protestant kind of. Uh, church but it was more like a castle i mean it had okay. a moat it had you know high walls and everything a fortress and uh that's one of the other things they didn't like about the uh baptists because they didn't have they weren't relying that much on the faith they they had you know a, re, their church was also a, a fortress so they people could retreat if they needed to and put up the walls and they were safe in, in this church and this was this what church was this what kind uh, of, who, who, who met? No, but who? But it was in Frankfurt. But who was meeting in this church? Who the used Baptist. that castle? Oh, the Baptists yeah. using that yeah. castle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just, the point is, uh, it wasn't to, to keep them safe from local people and stuff. This is just, that was uh, something that isolated them in a way because the others weren't included. Hmm. Because if anything happened, they'd close up the walls. They wouldn't let others in. You were, if you're a Catholic, you weren't getting into that protection or anybody else. And, uh, you know, and the peasants and a lot of other people thought, you know, the Baptists, uh, they're loud and unruly, but they're also very self-centered, obnoxious, think they're all that. <laughs> but the thing is, they, they organized and got them. So this is something that's, I mean, it must have taken an awfully long time to build. Uh, I would that. think and so. And that's where I read the book. That's where oh, I got really? the book that I started reading was in that castle. And it's right there in Frankfurt, right on the uh, uh, the Mine River. So okay. It's right, it's right on the Mine River, hmm. and uh, and uh, uh, but but when you look at it, it's awesome. It's hmm. like man, this is incredible, and uh, the walls and everything. And then it has a it, what looks like a very deep moat. There's just no water in it, but there's a definite bridge that was used to be a drawbridge. Uh -huh. And all that kind of thing. That'd, that'd be a nice church building. That'd be, that'd be a, <laughs> <laughs> wow, we got a castle here. Let's, uh, yeah. yeah. But that, uh, that is, uh, that's interesting. And, um, and yes, the, the migration that, did, that took place really shaped the United States and, uh, and other parts of Europe uh, when they would move around. And they would move around because of, you know, for various reasons, but uh, because of persecution being uh, one of them. Uh, and, uh, and it's also it's also notable to point out the difference between one of the key Baptist distinctives is separation of church and state, and that's one of the you know, uh, it's one of the the um, one of the one of the other indications as to why Baptists are not true Protestants, because Protestants the the the, the foundation of Protestantism was not a separation of church and state now. Many who are Protestants today, uh, and of course in America, the, the separation of church and state as far as the lack of a government establishment of a religion or the pro prohibition of the free exercise thereof is enshrined as the law of the land in our Constitution. Uh, and, but, but, so so for, it looks like everybody, and, and, and I think uh, you know, for the most part, uh, even many Protestant churches, they would, uh, would, go, would agree with that. They'd say, yes, we do believe in religious liberty, but you got to recognize that the whole root and foundation of Protestantism had nothing to do with the separation of church and state. It was just simply a power struggle. There were some theological differences um, between the Reformers and the established Catholic Church. 
but the, the, the separation of church and state, it was, and it's evidenced even coming to America, that even as late as the founding of America, that they still didn't believe in the separation of church and state, but the Baptists did. And that's, that's been a, a Baptist distinctive uh, and, uh, and a very important one at that uh, because it's, it's such a consequential one. I mean, if you don't believe in separation of church and state, that's how people end up in prison for their faith. That's how people end up being burned at the stake uh, for their faith. Uh, and, uh, and, and so very, very important distinction. Yes, Denise? Well, they separated from, uh, they separated where the Catholics had power, you could say they were separated, but anywhere that the Protestants had power, they did the same things the Catholics did. So in that regard, they did not live by the principles they wanted, they wanted not, they didn't want to be persecuted by the Catholics, but then whenever the Protestants got in power, they turned around and persecuted Baptists. I, I, I um, so like that is what I was reading in oh, 1880, 1882 or something like okay. that is when they uh, went to Texas. But the, 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 one of the things that I was reading is that's how that castle came about. Yeah. This was all from their own resources. Yeah. They had no support from the German government or from the, uh, the German, um, I don't know, it's not a state they call it, but the, uh, that area, the Frankfurt area. Those, those Baptists there got no support from the government at all. They, they refused support, and they're the ones that built that, that castle. Mm. And it, it took a long time. It took them about 80 years or something to build this thing. And, uh, and, then, and that's what, why some of them were so reluctant to leave, because they had this beautiful church you know, uh, in the Frankfurt area. And literally everybody in the Frankfurt area that was a, a Baptist went there, mm. these, that sect or whatever they want to call it. And, but they got no, no support. Even though the state considered them uh, Protestant, they they didn't get support from the, the uh, church. Oh, okay. And, and but the interesting thing is, is they had to pay taxes anyway. Mm. They had to pay yeah. uh, church taxes to the Protestant. That's why the, one of the reasons they were leaving because they couldn't use it with them. They had to pay it into the Protestants, and then the Catholics had to pay into the Catholics. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. And by the way, I just thought of this, um, talking about separation of church and state. Think about this. During the reign of Antichrist, there will also be no separation of church and state. Mm. There, that, that, will, that, that will make a comeback as far as the joining of government and... Religion, And by the way, I, I don't know what, it, what it'll look like then compared to now, but we are, also, we are already seeing the government establishment of religion. But it's not in the traditional sense saying, well, the Catholic Church is the official church. or the No, it's here are the principles. Here are the values that are being uh, set in place by the governments, not just the U.S., but uh, governments around the world, such as... Um, uh, well, many of these, many of the social issues we're seeing today, it's one thing to be against racism, but it's another thing to uh, espouse the teachings of what's called critical race theory. Critical race theory has to do with, well, America was inherently, you know, white, white people are inherently privileged and America is inherently sinful and the evils of the original sin of racism. So that in and of itself is turning into a religion. And it's being endorsed by the state in certain, in a lot of cases. Um, same thing with the, the, whole, the whole pride movement. That is, there, you, 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 must, you must be an ally. You must support them. You must, or you're hateful, you're bigoted. You are, uh, and so these things are, people are latching on to certain issues with the same type of religious fervor. And, it's, and it is, in some ways, resulting in, uh, if you want to say persecution against those who would, who would go against that. Uh, but, and, and today it's more of the, the term is called cancel culture, but it is a form of persecution. Now, fortunately, people aren't being burned at the stake. 
but you know, people might eventually be put into prison uh, in the U.S. And look at if you look at Canada, Canada is is much is ahead of the U.S. in that. But I think as as a country, if we're not if if something doesn't happen that to change the course of things, we could be headed the same direction as Canada. Now, fortunately, there's still enough. Uh, um, people in America who are willing to dig in their heels and, and uh, not, hopefully not let it go that way. But we have to be careful of that and, and realize that there is, in, in, in the, uh, during Antichrist rule, there will be no separation of church and state. People will be required to worship the beast. They'll be required to take the mark. Uh, and it's a combination of, of economics, religion, and, uh, and politics, uh, the government. And, the, and there's the, there will be the combination of that uh, during that time. So uh, very important, very consequential. Uh, in the, the, the other, what goes along with separation of church and state is liberty of conscience, of not forcing people to, uh, at the edge of a sword, uh, saying, well, you, you, you better believe this way or you're going to prison, or you better believe this way or you're going to uh, be put to death. Uh, and so the... It's, it's not up to the government uh, to, to tell people what they should believe and how they should think. Uh, it's people have the choice. Well, am I going to be part of this church? Am I going to identify with the teachings of this church? And people have that, that liberty to make that choice for themselves. Um, and uh, very, very important. But that's interesting history there from Germany. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. So... Um, let me put that all up there. I messed up that. Uh, I forgot to, I guess, do the, the uh, animation. Oh, the battery's running dead already, so we better get this done. Actually, let me plug this in real quick. Um, thought I had enough. It's funny how high-tech stuff is so dependent on low-tech things. Like electricity? Like batteries. Oh, battery. <laughs> <laughs> all these brainiacs develop this. Yeah. And they don't <laughs> Well, this computer has, has been, been around for a while. And uh, although the new, the new laptop I got earlier this year, the battery life on that is awful. I don't know what it is, but it's just, just, it's just awful. So not sure why. Um, so in June of 1575, two Dutch Anabaptists were burned to death at Smithfield. One was Henrik Terwucht. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Hendrik Terwucht. He was only about 25 years old who had been married only a few weeks. He had fled to England to escape persecution in Fleming. The other man was Jan Peters. He was an older man with a wife and nine children. His first wife had been martyred in Flanders, and his current wife was the widow of a martyr. And so she would be widowed twice, um, due to martyrdom. I mean, just, just think about that. Think about what a life that is. And, uh, you know, a 25 year old and then a man who had already lost his wife and then he married a woman who then had already lost her husband and she was gonna lose her husband again to persecution. The uh, uh, one writer, Cramp, said that Elizabeth's warrant to burn the Baptist was nearly identical to Queen Mary's warrant to burn Archbishop Cranmer. And so that was Queen Mary the Catholic persecuting a Protestant. And, uh, but he, he said, he, he wrote that I have these warrants right in front of me and I'm looking at the language of them and the, the, it's, it's almost verbatim. It was almost verbatim uh, as far as how they handled, as far as it was during Elizabeth's day when they burned those Baptists. Around uh, 1588, Elizabeth joined, appointed John Whitgift as Archbishop of Canterbury. And he was very zealous to uh, fulfill making the Church of England doctrine, the law of the land, making sure that law of the land was, was kept up, the Church of England is the established church, everybody should be believing that doctrine and being part of that church. And so in his zeal, he filled the prisons with Baptists. About 52 people were held for long periods in terrible conditions. Uh, and the persecution largely drove the Baptists out of sight during Elizabeth's reign, uh, and um, they, they, they either, um, some of them left, uh, or they 
they, they stayed, but then they had to go into hiding. And uh, so this was not a per type of persecution that then brought them out. Uh, pri previously, it, it brought attention to the fact that the Baptists exist. And so there, but then there's the word, oh, there's a Protestant queen, you know, Queen Elizabeth's now here, Queen Mary's gone, so let's go to England. And so then the opposite happened, where then the suppression of the Baptists then uh, put them uh, more out of sight during this time. They were still around, just not as predominant. King James I followed Queen Elizabeth and passionately persecuted Baptists. And it's important to recognize that even though those who um, someone could be used by God to publish his word, as, we, as, as, the, as King James authorized it, uh, and then there were those that were Protestants that had a hand in translating it. They were very well-learned men. So as far as their priority in the way they translated it, is, is, was admirable and good and used by the Lord, but as far as their practical living, and they were still part of that established church, and so there was still the persecution of Baptists. And, uh, and the last man burned alive in England for his religion was Edward Whiteman, a Baptist, and he was put to death on April 11th, 1612. And there was... Uh, that, wasn't, that doesn't mean that was the last person who died for their faith in England uh, because others died by wasting away in prison. And, there was, and the reason that they stopped the burning is there was such a public outcry against burning that King James was content to let them die in prison. And uh, so very, um, uh, very, I mean, it's just very sobering to think about this is England uh, this is a, I mean, I, I'd say as Americans, we identify the closest with England than we do any other European country because of the connections there. And, uh, and to think, you know, when I think of England, I think, okay, well, they're similar to America in a lot of ways. But then you find, and, but then when you look at the roots and their history, you find, well, they actually had a similar history as the other European countries did in regard to the established religion, the, um, uh, the church, the Protestant versus Catholic battles, which um, uh, uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland tie into that there with Great Britain and those Catholic Protestant battles. Uh, and so I, I, I like to think of England that way, but then when you just look at history, you say, well, no, there is a Church of England. There never was a Church of America, a Church of the United States. But thankful for uh, those who stood up for freedom, religious freedom here in the United States, and also then God used, uh, God would also turn the tide uh, there in England as far as um, opening things up there a little more as we'll get into some of the, the things that took place there uh, as we go on. Uh, and so I believe we'll have, uh, my intention is we'll have one more lesson on this section on the Anabaptists during the Reformation period. And then we'll move on to, I think, maybe the last segment of that book, History of the Churches. And so as we wind, start to wind it down, but I really, really, uh, I intend at least to also go into some of the history of, particularly, I'm not going to go into the history of the churches in America, but primarily to bring us up to speed on the history of Baptists in America. And uh, I think that would be, be helpful to get that perspective.